You know, they don't want any part of it. Here's what, here's what they want. Here's what they mean by revival. They want to get some tingles and some chill bumps running up and down their spine. And, and, and they want to stay in the church house and pray and tell God about men instead of going out and telling men about God. That's their idea of revival. And look, and I'm telling you something. You can have chill bumps big enough that a piglet can suck on them. And if you're not out telling somebody about Jesus and soul winning to keep people out of hell, you're not having revival, friend. There's no way you can have revival if you're not willing to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Every time they got full of the Holy, full of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, they were going out preaching the Word of God. Amen. Now turn to verse 16. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I'm definitely going to have to spend some time here in this verse. <laughs> because this verse right here is, oh man, there's been a lot of confusion about this verse. And this is the baptismal regeneration crowd's favorite verse. This is like Church of Christ's favorite verse here. And it's almost as if the Lord put a few verses in here to be stumbling blocks for people who, who just absolutely refuse to believe in salvation by grace through faith and they want to have something to do with it. They got to get in there and, and try to manipulate it and, and they got to get in there and try to, you know, I, man, I got to have something to do with my salvation. I, I, got, I got to have something to do with it. They just can't let it go. They just can't say Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. So it's like Jesus actually puts a few verses in here to, to give them something to play with. Because, I mean, Jesus wants you to believe in salvation by grace through faith. And if you reject that, you can find any verse in the Bible to believe anything you want to believe. I can prove to you right now, and I could justify sodomy to you from the Bible if I wanted to justify it. Hey, you know what? The Bible says during the rapture, two men shall be lying in one bed. One shall be taken, the other one left. Hmm, what were they doing in the same bed together? <laughs> you, know, you know, hey, the Bible says Jonathan loved David. Had, Jonathan's love had more love for David than even a woman. Or was it vice versa? Was it Jonathan loved David or David loved Jonathan? Jonathan, David, 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 David. Jonathan loved David more than even a woman, he said. So, you know. <laughs> but you see how you could make, you see how you could twist Scripture to make it say anything you, want, you could lift one scripture out of the Bible and ignore the whole of scripture and make it say anything you want it to say. And that's why we've got so many cults. Now, like again, this is the Church of Christ go-to verse. They ignore the whole of scripture. They reject the whole of scripture and just single out this one little verse here. And see, when a saved person, when the Holy Spirit reads something like this, Here's what they say. Well, I don't, I don't really understand what this is trying to say, really. I, I don't really understand what it's trying to say. But I know this. There's no way this one verse contradicts John 6, 3, 16. I don't fully understand what this is trying to say, but there's one thing I do know. Is that this verse does not contradict the greatest verse in all the world, John 3, 16. No way, no how. Now, I'll just move on and just keep reading because the problem's with my understanding. The problem's not with God's Word. That's what a normal person would say who has the Holy Spirit. But an unsafe person will take that and run with it. Now, let me deal with what it doesn't mean. This is not saying that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. I'm going to get to what, it mean, what I believe it means here, but first let me deal with what it doesn't mean. Number one, I'm going to tell you some reasons why. It cannot mean... That you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Number one, because it contradicts hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses. You know, especially one we, one we just read about, the thief on the cross. We just read about the thief on the cross where he was saved. In, was it Mark 15? But when you confront the church of Christ and when you confront these people about that, well, what about the thief on the cross? They'll tell you that after Jesus rose from the grave... Now there's a different dispensation. And now you have to be baptized in order to be saved. But here's what they don't understand. 
First of all, dispensation doesn't mean a period of time. Second of all, they don't understand that there has never has been a dispensation for salvation. Salvation's always been the same and always will be the same. You never were saved by the law. All right? Never. Abraham believed it was counted unto him as righteousness. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, let me just quote some scriptures for you that says and proves that we're saved the same way after Jesus died as we were saved before Jesus died and rose from the grave. John 20, 31. Now, John 20, 31. Is John 20, Jesus, I believe, rose from the grave in John 19, 18 or 19. But I guarantee you one thing, John 20 is definitely after Jesus rose from the grave. All right? So listen to John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name, proving that we're saved by believing after Jesus rose from the grave. Again, Acts 10.43. Now, Acts is definitely way past Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, that's in a whole another book of the Bible, a whole other another book after the resurrection. That's in Acts. Jesus rose from the grave in, in, in Mark 16. Now we're all the way into Acts chapter 10. So obviously it's after he rose from the grave. Acts 10, 43 says, To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now let me ask you a question. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Is Romans after the resurrection or before the resurrection? After the resurrection. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. No, no dispensation for salvation, saved by believing in Christ before the resurrection, saved by believing in Christ after the resurrection. So that's the first reason why this is not saying you've got to be baptized to be saved. Number two, unbelief is what condemns a person not, not being baptized. I mean, Jesus spells it out right here in this same verse in Mark 16. He says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So he specifically tells us what damns a person. What damns a person is not believing, not not being baptized. Not, not being baptized does not damn you. Not believing is what damns you, all right? So he specifically clears it up in that same verse. All you got to do is keep reading that same verse to see that it's not, that baptism doesn't save or damn a person. It's belief. I'll give you a third reason why that can't mean you have to be baptized. Uh, can't mean you have to be baptized in order to be saved, because Paul said, "For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel." Amen. Now, don't you think that if you had to be baptized to be saved, Paul would have been pushing baptism? And Paul did baptize a few, but that was not the focus of his ministry, because he was not a he was not a uh, Paul was not a, a deacon or Paul was not a pastor. He was not a bishop. So that's the reason why Paul's not baptizing a lot of people here. He was leaving that up to the local church. He was leaving that up so, so they could be baptized into the body. They could be baptized in the local church, and now they've got a church family. So that's why Paul wasn't out doing a lot of baptisms. He did baptize some, you know, in the situation. You know, and, and, and one of our church members asked me one time, says, you know, what happens if I was up at Canyon Lake or something, and, uh, you know, I led somebody to the Lord, and... Uh, do you think it would be appropriate for me to baptize them? And here's what I told him. I said, well, it would be better if you brought them to the church because now if they're baptized at church, now they've got a body they can identify with. But, you know, if you're in a worst case scenario and they were, you know, they lived in a, you know, Iraq and there was no Christians over in Iraq and they're getting ready to fly somewhere. I said, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd baptize them then. You, you had to baptize them then. But if you can get them to church and bring them to church, you need to get them baptized at church so they can identify with that local body, be baptized into that local body. But anyway, Paul wasn't doing that uh, much. He did do it some. But um, the third reason was Paul said, uh, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Look, you better believe that if baptism was necessary for salvation, Christ would have sent Paul to do that as well. Number four, the fourth reason is, the only time in the entire Bible the question was ever asked, what must I do to be saved? Baptism's never mentioned. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's the only time that question is ever asked in the entire Bible. What must a person do to be saved? Baptism is never mentioned. Okay, you say, well, Brother Manley, what does it mean then? If it doesn't mean you have to be baptized in order to be saved, what's the point? What does it mean? When it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I believe it's just a simple statement. It's not a condition for salvation, it's a statement. Now, you could make a similar statement like, he that believeth and joins the church shall be saved. He that believeth and goes soul winning shall be saved. He that believeth and takes communion shall be saved. He that believeth and giveth tithes shall be saved. He that believeth and says the sinner's prayer shall be saved. Because guess what? He that believeth and does anything shall be saved. <laughs> Anytime you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. But look, when someone is willing to say the sinner's prayer with you, or someone is willing to get baptized after you give them a good thorough presentation of the gospel, that's normally a good surefire evidence they got it. That's proof that they got it. Now, it's good to get proof and good to understand that somebody's really saved. That way you can move on and try to get somebody else saved. You know, if they got it, then let's move on. Let's, let's shift our focus to them towards discipleship. And let's shift our focus on evangelism, getting somebody saved somewhere else. They got it. Let's move on. So that's why it's good, and I believe Jesus is saying here, hey, that, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be you can believe that person right there is saved. Especially back in those days. Because that was during the time of persecution. And you, you could believe, you better believe that if somebody was willing to be publicly baptized and jeopardize persecution, that was good evidence that they had been saved. Amen? Uh, let's see here. Again, baptism is not a condition, but a token that they actually do believe and trust in Christ. It means they, they, they meant business. They're willing to get baptized. That means they meant business. And guarantee it, they're saved. They're, they shall be saved. 